you go just right, probably under two hours, so we don't see each other often enough for sure, but, um, oh, I'm not done yet, so, yep, yep, so, now this is the guy, all right, so, now, now, I got a point, so, I tell the church this quite often, so you just need to know, I, I don't hide anything, but this is the guy that got me in that text group I tell you guys about all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's him. And, and, and I tell the church how I don't like group text, I don't, I don't hide any of this stuff, but I haven't dropped out of the group, Brother David. There's a way to drop out of it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Brother David was in this uh, in this group at one time, but this is again to our church uh, here, though, as, as I did tell them. Now, uh, we were we were so blessed, and, and I did use that as a platform to express our joy in the baptisms we had a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and uh, and then from there, you know, there was the joy from the the people in the text, and I told you, Brother Matt. Uh, told some folks at a homecoming West Virginia, and then all of a sudden I'm getting calls from another preacher. So as much fun as I make of that texting group, the Lord uh, kind of used it for that, and, and it's been a great blessing. And, and brother, you, you sure are a great blessing, and we we do appreciate you. And I am God. <laughs> yeah, I've been blamed for that text group just about everywhere. I, <laughs> I will tell you that between Justin and Matthew, uh, they're what keeps it alive. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> well, I do appreciate your your invitation to attend. Uh, I have preached. I've been invited to preach once, you what? and I think this is my fourth time to preach. So I'm, I'm, always, thankful. I'm always thankful for the invite. Uh, always thankful to hear the brother, my former pastor. It's always a blessing to hear you all. Uh, the song special. Uh, there's very few people that I consider a threat to my base level, and I don't even try. In so I, I do appreciate that. I appreciate all the gentlemen who are prepared to preach today. Uh, most importantly, I prepare, or, uh, appreciate the prep work on the oh, church. Yes. Uh, having only been a pastor for a year, I see <laughs> now on the other side how much work goes into having these meetings. Um, I've also learned from the text group that nine months is a little too long to give up subjects. <laughs> just, uh, just a little. Yeah, for, for, for topics as far as that goes, you don't want to give people a nine-month lead time. Two, <laughs> two days might not be uh, a whole lot either, <laughs> but, but nine months seems to be quite a lot. If you will, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. And as you're turning there, I'll let you know we're going to speak on uh, uh, part of Elisha's ministry. It's his early ministry. We're going to look at the idea of contentment. Uh, the subject title is It Is Well. Amen. Uh, I did preach this message about a month ago. It was actually going to be something I was going to preach in North Carolina uh, for Brother Andy Proctor, and I was able to attend. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough message. And I will try to point out when it's tough when I read it and when it's tough and I, when I extrapolate it. But I, I want to give you a feeling of, of, of what's taking place here first. So Elijah, uh, his ministry here in 2 Kings chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. That right there is where it gets tough, and I'll tell you why. And she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as, as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto him, and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is it to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. In other words, it is well. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, and he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And I pointed out to my church, that last part was just unnecessary. <laughs> that uh, husband is old. It's almost like saying, I think David's here, but he's <coughs> kind of Brother Matthew's head. I, I think those are kind of statements. We don't I, I didn't say anything like that. I, uh, just, that happened before you got here, brother. That's what you missed. Show up late and Justin takes shots. <laughs> Verse 15, and he, and he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, and, and, and these words will haunt you. Verse 16, and she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto, this, unto thine handmaid. 
Verse 17, And the woman conceived and bare a son at, the season, at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to, to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him into his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed, him on the bed of the man of God. This is the room that she had prepared for him. And shut the door upon him and went out. And you'll see if you were to read the rest of this chapter, there's quite a few times in uh, the early ministry of Elijah <coughs> where a door is shut. Uh, this speaks greatly to the idea of sincere worship. Mm -hmm. The door was shut upon him and they went out. Verse 22, And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore will I go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Maybe some of us face that question today. Why are you going to Mount Vernon on a Saturday? Why are you going to church on a Saturday? It's Saturday. It's college football day. What are you doing in church? Just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. Verse 24, Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. Don't wait for me. Don't slow down for me. Keep going. Verse 25, So she went and came into the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, a servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Yeah. If you mark your Bible, you might want to circle that verse or highlight that verse. Mm -hmm. We know where she's coming from. We know what she's experienced. And her answer is, It is well. Yeah. Verse 27, And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. And, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? We know she did. We saw that back in verse 16. Verse 29, Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins. And take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Verse 31. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in there, therefore, and shut the door, once again, upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. He shut the door before beginning this prayer. He shut the world out, the crashing waves and the boisterous winds. He shut the door that he might pray to the Lord over the matter that he was bringing before God. Without distractions, without iPhones, without Android phones, without any other buzz of the world, he shut the door for sincere worship Amen. with the Father. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon the twain, and prayed unto the Lord. Verse 34, And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and opened his eyes. Verse 36, And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was coming unto him, he said, Take up thy son. In verse 37, Then she went in and fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, and took up her son, and went out. Let's pray. Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this portion of text, for the many, many blessings, no doubt, that uh, lie therein. I pray, Lord, that you be with my lips and my tongue this afternoon, mm -hmm. Lord, as we try to express the idea of contentment. We try to express what it is like to have our eyes upon you, as Brother Doug had pointed out. The contentment that we are to find therein, that your will be done and not yes. our own. Help us to put ourselves aside to bear our cross and follow after you, Father. We thank you for this fall fellowship. We thank you for the opportunity to, to dine and speak and play with one another, Father. And we just thank yes. you once again for this church and her pastor and the countless hours that went into pre preparing for this meeting. And we thank you for this church. We thank you for yeah. this neighborhood. Yeah. And we thank you for the families represented here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So today we look at the life and service of the Shunammite woman. I told you that this was a tough sermon. There's many, 
many reasons why it's tough, but uh, one that the world would have us to believe is why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. And in verse 8, God's Word said this was a great woman. Now, I'm not preaching against the idea that we're all fallen. But understand, He doesn't just take some wicked, unnamed heathen here and allow something horrible to happen to them. This was a great woman that had the needs of one of God's own men in mind. Not only one, but him and his servant in mind. And He allows for this thing to take place, though. In verse 16, she says, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. Do not promise me something I've not asked for, she says. So we see this devastating loss of her son to a great woman, as Scripture calls again. We're not saying someone without sin. We're calling her a great woman, a great woman of service. Yeah. The city of Shunem meant a double resting place. We see here it was Elisha and his servant, Gehazi, that found rest in this woman's home. Again, God's Word refers to her as a great woman there in verse 8. But what great blessings must await someone who shows such care for the men of God. A church like this that puts on a fall fellowship that shows such great care for the men of God. Even the ones who are just visiting. The great care that is shown towards us and the, the amount of food that's provided for us every single time. It's a, it's a great wonder that the Lord continues to pour out these blessings. Amen. But we see two such blessings in particular for the Shunammite woman. The initial blessing came to the woman in response of her generous heart toward God's prophet. We see that in verses 13 through 17 of our text. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? She says, I dwell among mine own people. I am content. I am well. It is well. I have everything that I need. I only wanted to provide this for you. It was an unconditional offering. She wasn't offering them a room that they might mention her from the pulpit. You know what the thrill of that is like. Mm -hmm. Especially if Justin picks on you like he does David, right? <laughs> she wasn't doing that for attention. She wasn't doing that for special care. She wasn't even doing it for a son. She was doing it because that was what was on her heart according to the scripture that we have here. Amen. Verse 14, and he said, What then is to be done for her? And now he's speaking to his servant Gehazi. There's much more about Gehazi, I understand, that we won't be able to get into this afternoon. I trust when you finish Matthew, Justin will go back there and, and expound okay. upon Gehazi and why he wasn't able to heal the boy. So much there uh, that I haven't even got to in my own well, Okay, man. <laughs> just, just let you off the hook a little bit. But understand, he turns to Gehazi, and Gehazi says she has no child, and parenthetically he says her husband's old too. Praise the Lord he didn't just give her a younger husband. This would be a much different lesson if that was the part of this Elisha chose the point. To, to focus on, but he, he chooses to give her a son. He said, about this season, verse 16, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto this handmaid, unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived, the very next verse, and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. Her response to this offer was, all was well. I dwell among mine own people. She didn't have a want, it was an unconditional act of love. We see there in verse 18 that as the boy was a little older, he's not a full adult, he's still a boy. It is a lad, if you look at the text, that is carrying him to his mother. So he's still uh, probably Isaac's age, but maybe not as dirty for football. Yeah. Sorry, son. Make sure you're with so We see in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. This would have been where he was working. And he said unto my, his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Oh, how our words come back to haunt this pastor as we see in the text again in verse 16. Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. Particularly, uh, and I'm sure many of the brethren have been in this situation where you're asked to preach at a conference, maybe far in advance, maybe at the last minute, and the Lord gives you a topic and you say, please, Father, not that Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that I was taking Nathan's spot, mm -hmm. knowing why he's not here today, mm -hmm. uh, now knowing that Brother Doyle's gone home. Uh, when I first initially preached this message, uh, I wept through the latter half of it just because of two miscarriages that we've experienced in the last three years. But every time this topic comes up, and every time I, I look through Second Kings, I can't get away from the fact that it is well. Yeah. It is well. I'm giving you the end of the sermon right in the middle. It wasn't my plan. But you need to understand that even with what Brother Nathan's going through, even the Thomas family and what they're going through, and the countless others who are affected by these great, these great men and these great families, it is absolutely well with God. Amen. 
Where did this dear woman run during her time of trouble? According to verse 22, she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God. To the man of God. We too should write it to our memories that there is no better place to run in our times of trouble than to God. Sure. Rather than away from Him. We'll get an example in a moment of yeah. the opposite. She wanted to run to the man of God. She wanted to run to her closest source to the Father. Did she run expecting another blessing? Does our text say that she ran to Him thinking, He gave me one, maybe He'll give me another. Maybe triplets this time. Maybe a little girl. No, she wasn't running and looking for such things. In verse 23, when asked why she was running to the man of God, she told her husband, it shall be well. Her husband even points out that it wasn't the right time of year, wasn't the right time of month, wasn't even the right time of week and, shit, and, and, and such that she should expect to be seen by the man of God. Do you know that God doesn't have office hours? Amen. Amen. The great mediator doesn't have office hours. Lawyers do. We have the example of what mediators and lawyers do. They have office hours. And sometimes it depends on who you are. Not with God. Amen. God doesn't have office hours. God doesn't have 1-800 numbers picked up by a help desk. Help desk. God says, pray unto me, and I will strengthen it, meaning I will continue to pour out my strength unto you. Amen. I'm thankful for the verses that were handed to us in our, in our bulletin. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Countless other times he defines us as exceeding abundant. That means above all that we could ever ask for and above all that we will ever expect. Mm -hmm. That is how great and wonderful our God is in pouring out His blessings to His people. Amen. Her husband pointed out it wasn't the right time to be expected to be seen and her response was, it shall be well. Beware the words of Satan as he tempts us to lose faith. Sometimes even using those closest to us that he might speak fear into our hearts that have been made anew by the Lord Jesus Christ. Recall even the words of Job's dear wife when she said, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die! Job chapter 2 verse 9. Keep in mind this family had lost everything and everyone that they had ever held dear in life. But let's hear what Job's response was in Job chapter 2 verse 10. And you don't have to turn there for time's sake, I have it. He says, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? What we need to understand here is what is given of God is always good. Amen. And what is taken by Amen. God is always good. Amen. Romans 8.28 applies to what's been given as well as what's been taken away. Amen. That's hard sometimes. Amen. No, I'm lying. That's hard all the time. Yeah. We're like little children sometimes. When something's taken away, we That's know, right? right? Yeah. Not one bit. Even if it's the idea of a baby. Mm. One you've never held in your arms yet. I learned yesterday, I'm a bit naive, that they call them rainbow children or, or a rainbow child. I didn't know that's what that was. There's a lot of other things in society with rainbows these days you've got to take, uh, take with a grain of salt. But Something that you've never held, but you've already got the idea. And that's what she's referring to mm. in verse 16. Mm. Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. After two miscarriages, if someone were to tell my wife and I that we'll have a child and your husband's old, I would say, nay, don't lie, I'm 37. And she would say, nay, don't lie to the handmaid. We've been hurt in the past. And we don't want to go through that again. But the Lord says I'm on the other side. The Lord says I'm doing it to bring you closer, to bring you through. I am with you always to the end of all things. Amen. 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 The Lord says, keep your eyes upon me and I will bring you through. As Brother Doug pointed out, not only did he catch Peter, but the boisterous wind stopped. The very things that distracted him, the very things he was distracted by the cause for him to look away, ceased. Yeah. Upon losing all that he had in this life, aside from his own life and health, Job fell upon the ground in worship, saying, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Job 1, verse 21. I'd like to point out the word he uses for Lord here is Yahweh. Both times. Yahweh is used for the God who gave as well as the God who took away. 
He is one and the same, eternal and living and the same today. He is the great I Am. Amen. Amen. Job lost a lot more than many of us will ever experience. But he recognized that it was Yahweh who gave and it was Yahweh who took away. Yes. When Jesus was explaining to the church all the things that he would suffer for my sins, to continue to pick on Peter a little bit here, Peter began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. To this Jesus turned and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but for those that be of men. Matthew 16, verse 22 through 23. Again, it's a testament of faith that Peter was willing to say anything, because there were 11 other men that wouldn't speak, 11 other men that would never come forward and say a word. But we can always count on Peter to put our foot in our mouth saying exactly what we would do in that circumstance. Amen. God has ordained for things to take place in this life exactly how they need to. Amen. For the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8.28. Amen. Again, that's hard sometimes. It is. Especially when we lose things. Especially when we lose things. Did this woman want her son back? To answer this question, I only want to use the text, not my opinion. To answer this question, I want to look at two things, where she went and how she felt. In verse 25, we see that she went to Mount Carmel. She was going to the man of God, and she went to Mount Carmel, which was seven miles away from where she was. A great many trials of faith have occurred here. One of the most recent to this account was of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, he showed the very existence of God to 450 false prophets of Baal. Slayed every one of them. In the very next chapter, he goes a day's journey away from Mount Carmel, and he pleads with the Lord God, take his life. He says, end it now. I'm no better than anyone else, and I'm all alone. He says, I was jealous for you, Father, but I'm unable to do it. He looked away, as we just heard in the previous sermon. He looked away. He was at Mount Carmel, and he saw great things, but then he looked away. Why? Because Jezebel said she'd do the same thing to him. He slayed 450 prophets. He stood up and helped taunt these false prophets first. Maybe your gods can't hear you. Sing louder. Maybe everyone should stand up and shout. But the very next day, he goes a day's journey away and he prays the Lord take away his life. In 1 Kings chapter 19. This woman, this Shunammite woman, came to the mount seeking the counsel and comfort of God through his prophets. Be careful, dear readers, once again, that the trials in our life send us to God and not away Amen. from God. Amen. And looking at how she felt, we read in 2 Kings chapter 4, again in our text in verse 26, where it says, Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. Elisha speaking to Gehazi, his servant. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Important for us to note, this is Elisha sending Gehazi, not God, not Yahweh sending Gehazi. God knew the problem. God knew the need. But, and we'll see Elisha say later, the Lord hasn't told me why her soul is vexed. He didn't know what her need was. He just knew that she had one. Men of God, we aren't to run away from that. No matter what the subject, I think I'm a woman. I think I'm a chair. I want to take my own life. No matter what the topic, gentlemen. We need to address that if the Lord has sent us in that direction. You're right. We need to go after it with God's Word in hand. Amen. Every day is precious. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. If we avoid these uncomfortable circumstances, these discussions of politics, these discussions of, of whatever the movement is of the week, then we're hurting our testimony, but most importantly, it's something we're going to have to answer for. Yeah. You're right. Amen. You're right. She didn't scream from pain and sorrow. She says it as well. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? She tells Gehazi it as well. She didn't lash out in a lack of faith. She didn't even give the specifics of the problem to Gehazi, but rather recognized her condition was in the hand of God. Sounds like I'm reading a lot into it, but that's because those are the reactions we had to miscarriage. Lashing out at one another. Lashing out in pain. Anger. Intense anger, crying, mm. tears, mm. and she was hurting too. Mm. I don't say that to be funny. Right, right. We all go through that. We all go through that. Something's been taken away. Uh, 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 and if we're saved by God's grace, we understand it as a blessed gift of the Lord, and now it's gone. 
and we hurt. So this woman didn't show any of the signs that I would have shown. No pain and sorrow that, she, that, that could be told from the outside. She didn't lash out. She didn't even give the details to Gehazi. She just wanted to see the man of God. This great woman, as it says in Scripture, was having her faith tested. And in so doing, she was provided, she has provided for us an amazing testimony. As she reached Elisha, he recognized her soul was vexed, meaning bitter or twisted. She was hurting. Verse 28, then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? If you have experienced real pain, you know, you know how, how much it hurt for her to say that. If you've ever been so sad that every word is breathy, and what I mean by that is it's the last breath you feel like your lungs can contain without bursting into tears. And she says, Did I, did I not ask? Did I, did I not tell you I didn't desire a son? Did I not confess to you that I wanted nothing? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? She did not ask for this son, so her question now was, Why give me that which I did not ask for, only to take it away and cause such pain? Such a trial of her heart, or such a vexing of her soul, as our text says. But this happens from time to time. Still, this isn't just an Old Testament story, as the world would have us to believe. This is real. Amen. As real as creation. Amen. That's right. That's right. Loss is a part of this life. Loss is a part of death. Most time caused. By the very thing. Doubtless many who are hearing this sermon today have lost someone they loved. And asked the question, why, Lord? Again, as I pointed out earlier, my wife and I have had two miscarriages over the past three years. You can tell that we have three children. Some might say, well, you have three. Isn't that good enough? Some say people have literally said, well, you'll see them in the kingdom. <laughs> Even that hurts a little bit. Can you imagine such pain that this woman didn't desire this child? I don't mean for this to be interpreted as she didn't want him. Certainly as she gave birth to this child, and any mother can attest, she definitely, desperately wanted this child. She never wanted to let go of this child. And keep in mind, according to the text, this child didn't just die. He died laying on her lap. How horrible. Gentlemen, if you don't know... Where babies come from, you might have to ask someone else, but when they lose them, there's a great deal of that they experience alone. A great deal of that that they experience alone. Just as we don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before the bite of the fruit, we don't know how long our, our wives, our mothers have hurt with that loss before they opened up and talked about it, even to the husband. She was experiencing a great vexing. She had lost her boy. Many times those who can relate are asking the same question, Why, Lord? Right. Why? Of these two miscarriages, I can attest that neither one hurt more than the other. I don't want to belittle it, but loss is loss. And it hurts. And it's not compounded by the fact that there's two. It's compounded by the ideas that we go into. Am I broken? Am I... Have I forsaken the Lord? Have I disappointed in service? Am I not doing what I'm called to do? Am I not doing what I should do? Time distances us from the pain of the initial discovery of our loss, but it does not replace what we had hoped to have. If you're waiting for time to heal all wounds, you've fallen for another one of Satan's deceptions. I don't mean to bring you down at the end of the fall fellowship. Time does not heal all wounds. God does. Amen. And if you're looking to time, or chronos, or whatever false idol you want to call it, you're looking in the wrong direction and you'll fall. That's right. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Amen. Well, I'll look to Him when I'm done hurting. I'll look to Him when we're pregnant the next time. I'll look to Him when I have a need. I'll look to Him on Saturday night because church is the next day. Or Friday night because the Buckeyes are playing a tough one. But the Lord says, look to me at all times. And don't bring to me false idols, but come to me alone. For there is nothing that can be in the presence of my holiness. There is nothing worthy of me except that which has been called and sanctified by me, God says. Yeah. And sometimes this hurts part of that process. We don't want to think about that. Yeah. We don't yeah. want to think about that. Don't. I don't have the verse with me. I think it's Hebrews 11... Maybe verse 13. But 
let's go on a journey together as it looks like I have enough time to. <laughs> Hebrews, I believe, chapter 11, verse 13. No, that's not it. There, there's a portion, and I, I believe it's in Hebrews. Yeah, it was, it was next to my notes. That's what happens when you don't have a funny time to prepare. But why do we go through these very painful, very real occurrences in life? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says that it is for our profit. Let, let that sit for a minute. It's for our profit. No one here is going to volunteer to call the Brother Doyle's family and say it's for your profit. No one's going to call Nathan tonight and say it's for your family's profit. No one's going to tell my wife and I on the way out of here today that those miscarriages were for your profit. But God, who is able to be the mediator and has that great compassion and love for us, says that we might be partakers of His holiness. We've been called through these things. We've been called to experience things so hard that we have no other option except to turn to Him and cry out, Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. I'm fairly certain if you're in that particular season today and you hear me say that it's for your profit that you might be a partaker of God's holiness, that's not going to help you much. Those words... Praise the Lord, God's word does not return unto him. Amen. Praise the Lord for the power that lies within God's word. The power of his blood poured out in ink for us to read and to labor over and to hurt and to cry upon. Praise the Lord for his thoughtfulness of us. Understand that the plagues, worked out you had that up there. <laughs> Understand that the plagues caused in Egypt during the great exodus were for the same purpose. For the prophet of the Israelites, that they would be partakers of the holiness. Well, brother, wait a minute. Those plagues hit Egypt, and I got text to prove that they were saved in Gethsemane. They didn't even get affected by it. They could not understand. They could not take the over 2,200 false idols that were in Egypt with them. God was displaying His power as He destroyed one after another with Amen. every single plague. Amen. Amen. Proving to the Israelites, I am that I am. Amen. Proving to Egypt that I am the God of all creation. That's right. And though museums may say those rocks are old, we know the truth, praise the Lord. Amen. We need to understand that this thing that took place in Egypt... I don't even know the answer to that question. I, <laughs> I, know, I, I was struggling with it. And I was going to ask, but then you struggled with that, so I didn't know if you wanted to. <laughs> Understand that those plagues, I'll ask other later. Yeah. <laughs> those plagues were as much for the Israelites, as a matter of fact, more so for the Israelites than they were for the Egyptians. <laughs> it was God's wrath on Egypt, certainly. But if you look closely at the scriptures in Exodus chapter 7 through 12 and watch the nation of Israel, you'll find that they are being sanctified and separated from Egypt with every single plague. It wasn't pointed out after the first two plagues, I don't believe, that they were safe in Gethsemane. It wasn't until the second wave of three plagues that we start to see in the text. They were safe. Their cattle wasn't affected by the moraine. They weren't affected by the flies. And all of a sudden the picture becomes clear as we study through Scripture that the Lord had sanctified them, but they very much got to see and experience everything that was going on. Yeah. They're being cleansed and distinguished with every great movement of God's hand. Praise the Lord that He thought enough of us while we were yet enemies to do the same for us. With everlasting life we are forever able to sing, It is well. Amen. It is well. If we had time, if you don't already know it, go look it up. The writer of that song, It Is Well. It's an amazing story. We don't have time uh, this afternoon. I want to get into the second blessing. It comes towards the end of our text in verses 36 through 37. <laughs> Elisha calls Gehazi and says, call the Shunammite. So he called her. We, we already know, and I don't have time to get into the symbolism nor what is taking place here with the healing. Again, I trust your pastor will no doubt be able to do a fantastic job with that lesson. But understand, as he calls the Shunammite, she comes in unto him and said, Take up thy son. He tells the Shunammite woman to take up thy son. She went in, fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, and took up her son and went out. She has given her son restored. Her son, once dead, now quickened, given life, 
is certainly telling of the Lord's salvation to His elect. Born in sin, but chosen recipients of His free gift of grace. I love the picture here that Elisha had to travel to the deceased child to heal him. Again, there's other reasons why Gehazi wasn't able to do it. But Gehazi wasn't a substitute. It wasn't a, an adequate sacrifice. The man of God had to travel there himself in order to make this happen. The servant was not adequate to be a go-between. Praise the Lord that Jesus Christ Himself came to pay the price for me. I'm closing. i got to be close, brother. You are. <laughs> brother Duke said I had all the time in the world when I was last. And everybody's already eaten. And the game's not for hours. <laughs> how, much, <laughs> how much more did this son mean to her when gifted the second time? Amen. I thank the prodigal son and his, of the prodigal son and his return in Luke 15. It took a miracle to bring him back too. Amen. Did you know that? Mm. It took a miracle for that young man to realize, not that he spent all his money and it was time to go get more, but that he made a mistake, that he was no more worthy than the pigs or than the servants of his father, and it was time to go home. It took a miracle to bring him back. And oh, how the father rejoiced at his return. Luke 15, 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. As I close, I want to point out that when we are called home, these are what the blessed first few moments are going to be like. Brother Doyle's been enjoying that all day. Amen. The Father saw him, had compassion upon him, ran and fell upon his neck Amen. and kissed him. Oh, what bliss, what sheer joy. Keep that in mind, beloved, and all will be well by comparison. Amen. Amen. Amen.